Joining me, giving a warm welcome to Jonathan Gray. Thank you. And I just want to thank the other Jonathan for inviting me and thinking of me and giving me an opportunity to come to uh, Happy Valley. Is it, is it happier here than other places? Um, um, but so just to get started, on, on September 11th, 2015, um, in Flushing Meadows, Queens, Italy's Roberta Vinci defeated Serena Williams in the semifinals of the US Open. This shocking upset prevented Williams from completing the Grand Slam, or the first Grand Slam in women's tennis since Steffi Graf had done so in 1988. Uh, the loss also delayed Williams from equaling um, Graf's record of 22 major titles, uh, which in turn would enable tennis commentators to anoint her the greatest tennis player of all time. Um, this defeat dismayed Williams' legions of fans, among them First Lady Michelle Obama, who took to Twitter to simultaneously celebrate and console Serena. However, what I find notable about this defeat, other than the fact that it happened at all, was that it, it occasioned no controversy, uh, with most observers attributing it to nerves and fatigue, the pressure of the moment finally getting to the greatest competitor in the history of women's tennis. In its mundane conclusion, the Vinci match was unlike her other notable losses earlier in Serena's career, including her defeats at the hands of Jennifer Capriati in the 2004 US Open and Kim Kleister's in the 2009 US Open, which Claudia Rankine memorializes in her book, Citizen, an American Lyric. Rankine focuses on these disputed defeats rather than on Serena's many, many moments of triumph in order to reframe these losses, to transform their received meaning through a provocative and counterpuntal reading of events. Uh, she accomplishes this in part by turning the old sporting maxim on its head. William's setbacks reveal not so much her character, but rather the character of a public that has only reluctantly accepted her presence. The public's resistance to Williams is most visible when she loses, um, or more, more accurately, in their reaction to how she loses. Um, indeed, in Claudia Rankine's profile of Williams for the New York Times prior to the 2015 U.S. Open, she seems unintentionally to anticipate her defeat and also, her willingness to and also the public's willingness to find fault in Serena. It is as if, knowing that Williams is fated to lose, Rankine wishes to point out to the New York Times readership that Serena's achievements already mark her as the greatest of all time. In Citizen, um, Rankine rehabilitates Serena, as well as the French footballer Zinedine Zidane, uh, by recontextualizing what have come to be understood as their moments of ignominy. Uh, Rankine's contrapuntal, uh, uh, her representation of these figures reminds her readers that athletes like Williams and Zidane labor under a burden, that many of the fans cheering them on also wish to erase them the instant they cease to conform to a, a restrictive code of conduct that precludes any engagement with politics. Here I am following David Scott's suggestion that one way we might understand contemporary black life in, in the Americas is by problematizing the teleolo teleological narratives that are so often employed to discuss the gradual inclusion of minorities into the civic life of the nation. Such a reorientation allows Rankine to propose a radical form of racial citizenship that rejects the politics of respectability and insists upon the minority subjects not right not only to live but react as he or she sees fit. Performing under the expectation of respectability weighs on both Williams and Zidane, a burden exacerbated by the public's ex expectation that they shoulder this burden without complaint. In Citizen, Rankine contrasts Williams' restrained loss in 2004 with her explosion in 2009. And it's instructive while attending to this to actually watch and see exactly what went on. And so here we go. Capriati said about playing Serena. Oof. Are you sure? And then I have a little cold. Okay, ball up. Let's hit that ball to that. What? what? Serena's going to come right over to talk to the chair. I, that was way in. That was way in. I always defer to you on this one.
Garcia. That was out there, is it? Wow. Square on the line. Okay, so um, I want to call attention to the contrast between the images of Serena's frustration with um, what is with with what's occurring, um, which forces her to literally bite her tongue. Um, so I want to contrast these images with the unconcerned, almost blase look on the referee's face, which seems to communicate not disdain, but a placid unawareness, as if she struggles to understand what's possibly upsetting Serena. This apparently is what the tennis establishment wants and what, and what Claudia Rankine finds objectionable. Not merely Serena's exit at the hands of an inferior player, but her compliance, her acquiescence in the face of this injustice. Right? And, uh, Rankin, um, I think she, the only commentator she quotes by name in this is John McEnroe, and I think she wants <laughs> us, she wants us to remember um, exactly how McEnroe responded to similar to similar events. Right? Um, in 2009, Serena is no longer willing to acquiesce in the face of similar treatment, and instead thunders at the offending line judge, while the sports commentary, including the previously supportive McEnroe, recoiled in horror at Serena's language. Rankin, quote, applauds her for existing in the moment, for fighting crazily against the so-called wrongness of her body's positioning against the service line. Where others see an out-of-control black woman, a poor sport, Rankin sees in this outburst, quote, a moment of manumission, an attempt to free her body of the history that marks it, and also marks her performance as exceptional, which is to say both outstanding and troubling because it's out of context. Um, Okay, so Williams has reconciled the burden of representing African Americans with a paradoxical yet somehow typically American focus on personal achievement. She informs Rankin in the New York Times interview, quote, I play for me, but I also play and represent something much greater than me. I embrace that. I love that. I want that. So ultimately, when I'm out there on the court, I am playing for me. This, contradiction, this is the contradiction that so endears Williams to Rankine, this ability to embrace the selfish pursuit of excellence without falling into the cliched language of color blindness and transcendence. William wears her political engagement lightly, freeing her to both play for me and also to inspire the black community, even if that freedom occasionally produces a polarizing, a polarizing rage. Um, while Serena Williams rejects the, the quote unspoken script that demands the humble absorption of racist assaults no matter the scale, Zinedine Zidane accepts the politics of personal responsibility that, accompany, that, accomp that accompanies his status as a, as a minoritized icon. When he, when he led France to their only World Cup title in 1998, he's number 10, um, followed by a triumph in 2000 at the European Cup, which is known in the footballing world as the double, he became not just one of the leading figures in the sports world, but also the embodiment of a multicultural France. And so here is the multicultural France, French of all colors and ethnicities coming together to, to win. However, unlike his American contemporary, and in 1998 the only person who was on his level was Michael Jordan, um, Zidane attempted to use his status to push the French state towards greater tolerance. In 2002, when Jean-Marie Le Pen's National Front greatly increased their representation in the French government by exploiting anti-Arab and anti-Islamic prejudice in the wake of 9-11, Zidane unsuccessfully appealed to the French public to reject the National Front's nativist rhetoric. Perhaps worse, for his status as a national hero, after failing to prevent um, Le Pen's political rise in the spring of 2002, Zidane carried an injury into the World Cup that summer. The French national team, the defending champions, lost in the first round of the World Cup in large part due to a hobbled and ineffectual Zidane. 
In the fall of 2005, in the banlieues to the north of Paris, um, there was a riot that resulted from the death of two teenagers, one of West African and the other of Algerian descent. And Zidane, if you don't know, is himself Algerian. Uh, the two boys died fleeing detainment by the police after playing a pickup soccer match. Um, with then Interior Minister Nicolas Sarkozy infamously referring to the, to the youth rioting in the wake of their death as, quote, scum. And the word in French is, 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 is racial, which has a, a, a racial history as well. This is the context for the French team's miraculous run in 2006, less than a year later, which um, Rankine memorializes in Citizen in the poem, Black Blanc Beu. This phrase evokes the multicultural France embodied by the French national team um, by displacing the French, color, the French flag's colors, blue, blanc, rouge, with the ethnicities black, white, and Arab. Um, this phrase is also popular among the youth in the Paris suburbs, um, in part because it serves as a, as a rejoinder to the ethnic nationalism of Le Pen's National Front through a simple assertion of the French nation's racial makeup. In the wake of all of this, Zidane, the tarnished legend believed by many to be, to be past his prime, was chosen to captain the French national team in the 2006 World Cup. Les Bleus' leader, in fact, as, and, um, now in fact, as well as in spirit, Zidane announced before the 2006 World Cup that he would retire from football at the conclusion of the tournament. His last match, whenever it came, would be the last of his career. Miraculously, Zidane carried France to a place in the World Cup final, where they would face Italy. Jean-Marie Le Pen, his voice now augmented by his daughter Marine, seized the opportunity to pay back the Arab other for meddling in French politics by making an unprecedented appeal on state television. He urged his followers, and indeed all true French, French citizens, to root against the French national team. Um, and instead root for Italy. In other words, to reject the multicultural black blanc bleu and instead support an all-white team. This is the context that produces Zidane's moment of excess, his moment of failure. Zidane co competes not just against a talented Italian team, but also against the history of French fascism and bigotry. A victory for Italy is a victory for Le Pen's national front, while a victory for France again validates, at least temporarily, the French multicultural experiment, silences the Le Pen's, and repudiates Sarkozy. Um, Rankine, by including Zidane in a text that announces itself to be concerned with American citizenship, cunningly links the historical tra trajectory that, that produces Zidane's 2006 moment with earlier moments of um, politicized sporting practice. Here we have Jackie Robinson um, stealing home in the World Series. Um, but more pertinently, we have Jesse Owens. Um, this is 1936 competing in the Olympics in Berlin in front of Hitler in Nazi Germany. And everyone always notices um, the guy um, on one side who won, who won the silver medal. He's a German and he's giving the Fuhrer stance. But the bronze medalist was, was also um, Japanese. And so Jesse Owens had fascism on the right of him and fascism on the left of him, right? Um, so anyway, so um, Rankine links Zidane to this trajectory, right? Um, and of course, despite all of this burden, Zidane plays brilliantly and leads his team to the precipice of victory, where he is denied by the cruel hand of fate. And since some of you don't watch football at all, <laughs> this is a dime with right there. Okay, so that, that save was voted the greatest save in the history of soccer. Um, I, I'm not making that up. Um, and, part, and, and part of the reason is because uh, Buffon, the goalie, he plants his feet and he's actually going the wrong way. Um, and so, but this is, and, and so this is important. So um, if, you, if you look at the, at the top, you saw it, it, it said 13, um, but 
the way that French time, the way that the, it's weird, the World Cup, how they time their matches, there's, there, was, there was only um, two minutes left in the match. It was, it was counting up to, to 1.15. So it was literally two minutes from the end. Had he gotten that goal, France wins the World Cup. And by the way, the score was 1-1. Who scored the first goal for France? Zidane, right? And so, I mean, this is, he's, he puts in this heroic effort, right? Okay, so, um, it's also important to see um, how, I mean, you can see how they are just befuddled, like, I can't believe that, that he was able to make that save, right? Okay, so, um, imagine the sense of relief that must have flooded Zidane's body in that split second when the ball is still in flight and seems destined for the back of the net. The culmination of a career, the excision of the burden, the final confirmation of his greatness, the metaphorical but very real triumph over French fascism and the odious Sarkozy. To see all of this brushed away by Buffon's fingertips pushes Zidane to his limit. He can no longer quietly endure the quotidian struggle against dehumanization, not just his dehumanization, but also the dehumanization of every Algerian in France, every Muslim in France, every person of African descent, everyone he represents. It has all become too much to bear. When, quoting Zidane, Rankine reports that, quote, what he said touched the deepest part of me. It is difficult to know whether this refers to the taunts of Marco Macarazzi, the Italian defender, or the violent rhetoric of Jean-Marie Le Pen. Um, and so, as with Serena Williams, Zidane lashes out at his, at his tormentor and lays him low. While Zidane has always expressed regret for this loss of composure, Rankine encourages us to understand this as another moment of manumission by crafting a polyvocal poem made up entirely of quotations, including not only phrases from Zidane, but also invective from the crowd and passages from literary figures ranging from James Baldwin to William Shakespeare. The accumulated meaning of these voices suggests that for, that for Rankine, manumission is not simply the ratification of laws that grant freedom, nor is it the possession of papers that attest to one's ownership of oneself, but instead it's a transgressive act that overcomes those seeking to dehumanize and objectify, those intent on shrinking the possibilities of one's life. Rankine signals this sense of manumission as struggle and resistance when she cites um, Frederick Douglass um, from his, uh, his, his, his first autobiography. Quote, but at this moment, from whence came the spirit I don't know, I resolved to fight and suiting my action to the resolution. Right? And this is a famous confrontation between Douglass and, and the slave breaker Covey that transforms Douglass from object to subject. Right. Okay, so as with her earlier work, um, Don't Let Me Be Lonely, Rankine's Citizen is a hybrid text, and this hybridity extends beyond the linguistic. Rankine introduces black blank beurre in Citizen as, a, as, quote, a script for situation video created in collaboration with John Lucas. Um, and indeed, um, Rankine and Lucas, a documentary filmmaker and visual artist who's also her husband, uh, they collaborate on a series of situation videos that utilize Rankine's poems as a, as a kind of teleplay. Right, and so here is one more. We'll just take, take a second to listen. Something is there before us that is neither the living person himself nor any sort of reality. Neither the same as the one who is alive nor another. What is there is the absolute calm of what has found its place. Every day I think about where I came from, and I am so proud to be who I am. Big Algerian shit, dirty terrorist, nigger. Perhaps the most insidious and least understood form of segregation is that of the word Okay, so it goes on like that. Um, if you've read Citizen, you know the poem. Um, how many people here have, ha have seen these, uh, these situation videos? Okay, two people. Um, all right, so for, for the rest of you, if you know Citizen, you, you're really, it's really incomplete without sort of tracking down these videos and looking at them. Um, okay, so um, the relationship between Black Blank Burr and the video that accompanies it complicates our understanding of the text. Right? Um, situation one, which is this video slash blank blank burr, is a multimodal, multimodal document with a recursive and reflexive relationship between these two distinctive forms. It's a video that incorporates words 
in the sonorous voice of Claudia Rankine, but it's also a poem that uses strips of film cells to both separate the stanzas and reproduce visually Zidane's moment of infamy. Right, and pardon my notes. <laughs> I had to take a picture of the page. Um, in an interview with um, Lauren Berlant, which is sort of amazing that Lauren Berlant and Claudia Rankine had a whole long conversation, um, Rankine herself comments on the kinds of revolution, revelations, pardon me, uh, produced by her collaborations with her visual artist husband. And this is a long quote, but it's so necessary. Um, quote, the decision to exist within the event of the situation videos came about because of the use of video manipulation by John Lucas, um, which allowed me to slow down and enter the events in moments as if I were there in real time rather than as a spectator considering it in retrospect. As a writer working with someone with a different skill set, I was given access to a kind of seeing that is highly developed in the visual artist, but that I don't rely on as intuitively. My search for meaning, did you, um, what do you think that means, is often countered with, uh, did you see that from John? That kind of close looking, the ability to freeze the frame, challenges the language of the script to meet the moment literally second by second. In the, in the Zidane World Cup piece, for, for example, to know as the moment knows and not from the outside. The indwelling of the situation pieces becomes a performance of switching bodies, um, of switching your body out with the body in the frame and moving methodically through pathways of thought and position. Okay, so Rankine's ability to switch bodies grants her the insight she needs to revision Zidane's actions, to understand his relationship to the state differently than Zidane permits himself to understand it. He's always been very apologetic about his loss of composure. Rankine rejects that, right? Um, thinking through how Rankine's collaboration with Lucas forces her to think in a different register returns us to Serena Williams, for whom there is no accompanying video. More accurately, Rankine's notions of collaboration forces us to consider her expectation of what her readers will take away from her, her celebration of, of, of Williams. For the moment of manumission to be legible as such, our understanding of Serena must extend beyond the matches played to include the memory of the matches themselves, to incorporate the labor of rooting for Williams that extends beyond indifference into an act of yearning for her to win. Um, in short, she puts the point of view of the black community at the center of her poem. The poem doesn't make sense, the moment of mission doesn't make sense unless you include her there, right? Um, and she augments this with several um, pieces of art in the text, including this by Glenn Ligon, which cites, um, which is itself a citation of Zora Neale Hurston, um, and then also this of um, Michael David Murphy, which is, um, this is, this is how it looks in the book, and then this is, a, here's a close-up of it. Um, and this piece, um, you know, sort of calls attention to the, um, to the ways that uh, uh, racial violence is part of what makes the suburbs the suburbs. Um, here's another, um, another piece, and this is, this is uh, an original contribution by John Lucas. He manipulates this image of a lynching by taking away the black body. Um, and by doing so, calls attention to the need for a rapacious consumption of black pain that confirms what Achille Bembe's contentions in Necropolitics that, quote, the existence of the other as, mor <clears throat> as mortal threat or absolute danger whose biophysical elimination would strengthen my potential to life and security is one of the many imaginaries of, sovereign character of sovereignty characteristic of both early and later modernity itself, right? Okay, taking note of the multiple collaborations with um, artists throughout Citizen, Lauren Berlant, sensitive as ever to formal interplay, describes Citizen as, quote, a kind of an art gallery playing out the aesthetics of a supremacist sterility. Of course, supremacist sterility functions in part via reduction, but also via the state's willingness to reduce the citizen to bare life, right? Um, and this tension, this, this tension, which, I mean, we, Serena's now heroic, um, Zidane is now managing Real Madrid, people have mostly put that behind him, but we can see this tension in another figure who's in the news today, right? Um, you know, so like, like Zidane and Williams before him, 
um, Kaepernick occupies this double space. He is simultaneously, and this is a Gallup poll, right? The Gallup poll said that he's the most hated player in the uh, NFL. Um, number two is a is a admitted rapist, but number one is the guy who kneels. Um, but he also has the most popular number one selling jersey, and he's added more copies to social media, more followers on social media than any other player in the NFL, right? So he's simultaneously an exemplary figure and a despised figure, and it's this tension that I feel that um, that Rankine is trying to play out, right? Okay. Um, Citizen, then, is a multimodal text involving a collaboration between a writer and a series of artists that celebrates heroic figures, capable of feats beyond the ken of most normal humans, in order to produce a collective sensibility in its audience. The tragic figures at its center struggle against the caprice of state power as they work to defeat an opponent that refuses to stay vanquished. Which brings us, naturally, to Captain America. Right. Um, so Captain America emerges as a counter narrative to the, lo to the logics of Nazi eugenics. Right. A blonde haired, blue eyed Ubermensch suffused with the egalitarian ethos of a U.S. infantryman. Right. And when I mention Captain America, most people in the room will think of this figure. Right. Um, but for the last two years, if you go into a comic book shop and pick up the comic, Captain America is actually this figure. Right, and extra points if you can name the rap album that this cover is based on. Um, but that, that's that's in the Q and A. Um, so, f so Sam Wilson, who was previously known as the Falcon in the movies, he's the Falcon, um, has now become Captain America, transforming a figure that has since 1940 served as a personification of the nation. Right, and so. Um, between 1966 and 1974, Marvel creates four iconic black superheroes. Black Panther and Storm are both Africans who um, sort of bring a certain kind of diversity to the Marvel superhero universe. But then there's Luke Cage, currently streaming on Netflix, um, and also, um, also Sam Wilson, the Falcon, who are both African-American heroes, right? And so in this like eight-year period, we have these four sort of iconic figures who become you know, important to the kinds of stories that Marvel wants to tell, right? Um, okay, so the introduction of black characters um, results in a cosmopolitan literary practice, right? Um, and so, oh, let me just quickly show you this because this is the first appearance of Captain America in 1939. Um, this is important though because it, it, this, this comic comes out before America enters into the war. Right, and so, and this comic is written by um, Joe Simon, um, who is, and, and illustrated by Jack Kirby. Both of them are Jews, immigrant Jews from the Lower East Side of New York City. And so, this is a sort of, uh, like, a, a sort of wish fulfillment, right? Okay, so, um, so there's this. And then here is the first appearance of the Falcon in 1968. Um, and what's interesting is, 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 the is, is the role that, that Nazism plays in both, right? Um, in this appearance, um, there's an island in South America that, that Captain America has tracked his arch nemesis, the Red Skull, to. The Red Skull is a Nazi super scientist. He's tracked him down there, um, but while he's been down there, Red Skull has been able to change bodies. And so now the Red Skull is in Captain America's body, and he has left and gone to New York, and he's left behind, trapped on the island, the Falcon, I mean, I'm sorry, Captain America, stuck in the Red Skull's body, right? And so he's able to convince, um, he's able to convince Sam Wilson of who he is, and he needs Sam hel Sam's help. He actually needs Sam to essentially lead um, what amounts to a, to a, to a slave rebellion. Um, there are some natives on the island who have been sort of pressed into the, into the service of the, of the Nazi scientist. He needs, you know, Sam to sort of distract um, the Red Skull's followers so he can sneak in and reverse the reverse the, the, the theft of his of his identity, right? Um, so here we have the image of the Falcon's first costume, right? Um, and then here we have the cover of the next issue where he's actually fighting against the Red Skull's minions, right? Um, so the cover of Captain America um, 118, which is what we're looking at now, places Sam Wilson at the center of the action, fighting against two of the Red Skull's exiles in their Nazi garb, while the mass visage of Captain America looks on approvingly. Um, this cover harkens back to, to Captain America's debut, um, but with the important difference that demonstrates the changed political landscape that the Falcon inhabits, right? So here is the debut, and here's his debut. The, the cover of Captain America 1 d depicts its hero confronting a Nazi threat in the form of Adolf Hitler. The cover of Captain America 18 positions Cap in the background 
as both a representative of the state and capable of endorsing a, a militant black masculinity and also as an, as an onlooker whose gaze simultaneously confronts and mirrors that of the reader. Uh, this cover casts Falcon as the hero of the text, but the threat he faces is notably diminished. Not the fascistic Hitler in the full force of the Nazi war machine, but a group of past their prime Nazis hanging out in South America. Um, um, okay, so this tension, though, between these various positions. Um, okay, let me just let me just quickly make a comment here. Um, with with this issue, he becomes the co-star of the book, right? And so he's in every issue from 118 moving forward. But with 134, it goes from being Captain America to being Captain America and the Falcon, right? And so that makes him the first black hero to have equal bullying equal billing, and it's important that this equal billing is with the embodiment of America, right? Um, and Marvel broke new ground for African Americans with this choice. A mainstream comic had never featured a titular black character, even as a co-star. Um, as Jason Dittmer notes, the Falcon's prominence, quote, called into question the, univer the, univers the universalism of Captain America and his understanding of America by decentering white narratives of America, setting the Falcon's loyalties against those of his white allies, right? Um, and even back then, though, this, the idea that, that the sidekick would become the main character, that the black man is actually the one who truly represents America, was always there, right? Um, of course, it's deeply embedded into in a sense of, of, of political respectability, right? Um, they're going up against um, um, a basically black mafiosi, a mafiosa, excuse me, and he says they're like a black version of the Klan, all they preach is hate whitey, they're dangerous fanatics. Now this is published in 1972, and it's a clear uh, um, um, allusion to the Black Panthers, right? And so it's like this is, so on the one hand we have the Black Panthers who are not even in the frame here, and on the other hand we have this homosocial, interracial, um, black-white intimacy as being posited as the proper way forward, right? Okay, so, um, okay, so the other thing though, um, <laughs> so, but here's the thing, right? Um, to be a superhero is to, is to, is to fight the supervillain, right? And so if, the, if you're the X-Men, you fight Magneto. And if you're Spider-Man, you fight the Green Goblin. And if you're Batman, you fight Joker. Joker. See, look at that. And if you're Superman, you fight Lex Luthor, right? And so that's part of what it is. And so you can't assume the identity without assuming the antagonism, right? Which means that when um, Sam Wilson becomes Captain America, he is forced into conflict with the Red Skull, right? Which creates a very different kind of a conflict, hearkening back to Jesse Owens, right? Um, <laughs> and the Red Skull's civilian name, and here's the, here's the good old Red Skull, the Red Skull's civilian name creates an interesting linguistic slippage, which in the spirit of Derrida I'm going to take full advantage of. Um, his name is Johann Schmidt, which is remarkably similar to the name of the Nazi theorist Karl Schmidt, who articulates the notions of, quote, a sovereign, dic a sovereign dictatorship, a state of exception where no law applies other than the will of the dictator. Um, Schmidt's philosophy, quote, recast sovereignty as the power to decide on the exception or decide when and in response to either an internal and external threat the law might be suspended right and here's a wonderful picture of Johann Schmidt and it's the Red Skull and no well <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is actually um, Carl Schmidt that's, that's actually not Johann Schmidt but but the resemblance is sort of incredible so I went with it um, okay and so this and, and so and so this creates a, a certain kind of tension then between this state of exception which is which which, is, which, which grants people the right to suspend citizenship. Think of, um, of uh, Guantanamo Bay as, as the paradigmatic state of exception here in America, the place where we send you where your citizenship no longer matters, right? Um, and it leads to a particular kind of confrontation, right? And so here we go. Uh, and I'll read this, this whole panel. Uh, I'm not perfect, but I, I, but I was never that person. Of course, that person is Steve Rogers, blonde hair, blue eyed, 6'4", right? Um, I'm Samuel Wilson, raised by Paul and Darlene Wilson to fight people like you for a better world. And like it or not, Nazi, I am Captain America. Fine, yes, you are Captain America, making your failure all the sweeter, right? Um, by the logic of narrative stasis, which is this, this repetition where Superman always fights Lex Luthor and never seems to ever put him away, um, um, actually, hold on. Um, how can a novice Captain America beat the arch criminal? 
um, how can this happen? It only happens if um, the, 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 the creators of the comic endorse a sort of Rankine moment of manumission, a kind of progression, right? So, so we have this repetition, but with an important difference here. To paraphrase Serena Williams, Sam Wilson here seems to realize, quote, I fight for me, but I also fight for and, and represent something much greater than me. I embrace that. I love that. I want that. So ultimately, when I'm out there being Captain America, I am being myself. Right? In a recent interview, Matarazzi um, revealed that he, res that he resented the Frenchman, um, Zidane, because the soccer world correctly viewed Zidane as, quote, a great champion, and the journeyman Matarazzi as, quote, useless and not in the same world. Incredibly, in the same interview, Matarazzi encapsulates the logic of white supremacy that Rankine str strives to overturn by expressing regret that Zidane never reached out to apologize. This exchange is telling, as it demonstrates how the post-colonial subject's citizenship remains conditional as long as he or she remains constrained by the dominant society's notions of respectability. Rankine demands a different kind of self-determination, one that replaces polite negotiation with a willingness to violate social norms in order, in order to create the space where authentic self-determination is possible. For Rankine, and finally for Zidane, and Serena, and Sam Wilson, emancipated black citizenship is one that grants itself the, 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 the emancipated black citizenship is one that grants itself the permission to be unruly and confrontational. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm just going to start things off with a question of my own because I, I do that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, and, and then we have time for Q&A uh, after that as well. Um, this idea of knowing as, to know as the moment knows, mm, mm -hmm. uh, I find it really, the, the hinge between yeah. like, the sort of slowing down the film of these situations and, and the kind of the way that comics works temporally. Yep. And I was, I'm wondering how much that functions in producing the moment, mm -hmm. the moment of menu mention. Right. Through the medium, the, the very problematic medium of allegory, right, right, I mean, uh, both in the sense of natural allegory in the comics, but also in the sort of the racial allegories of sports, right, which you know, I mean, as you know, you I know. Extends, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess my, my question is: To what extent does does the main mission not only operate as a kind of formal suspension, as a formal exception? Mm -hmm. But also, how does it work with regards to the allegory itself? Like, does it use allegory to create itself, mm -hmm. or does it somehow resist, does it work against the tendencies right. of allegorization, which would otherwise render the fate of the allegory up to the performance of it? Right, right. well see, I mean, it's, it's important to note the, um, you know, the way that by making the character black, it, it permits a kind of progression that isn't possible if Captain America just stays white, right? Um, I'm not perfect, the idea that like white American citizenship is innocent and beyond reproach. I'm not that, however, even though I'm not that, I can still represent the nation and stand up, right? And so it's that moment that suggests a kind of progression. It's also important to understand, like I think that Rankine is working against, um, like you know, Gates talks about the, the changing same in, in the black community community. Um, but if you think about, for example, you know, I, I put two sort of iconic, iconic sports figures up there in, um, in um, um, uh, Robinson and Jesse Owens, but, it, but if you think of, of another cultural figure, um, um, oh my god, I'm not just blanking on his name, uh, Paul Robeson, um, you see the important difference, right? Um, or rather, let's compare um, Tommy Smith, for example, who stands with his fist up on the, on the metal stand with Serena Williams or with Colin Kaepernick, right? Colin Kaepernick protests and, and in the midst of his protest is, is elevated, right? Whereas Tommy Smith protests and, and in the midst of his protest is destroyed, right? And so I think that it's important for, for, um, for Rankine to sort of understand the, the temp Oral specificity of these kinds of comparisons that we actually have made progress because Serena doesn't have to act like Arthur Ashe. She can be Serena. And that this is the vital change. And it's precisely the moments when she's not acting like Arthur Ashe that Rankine wants to focus on because it says something about the potentiality for black citizenship or for citizenship for, you know, for all people of color. That we don't have to be respectable, we can be ourselves. So. And it allows losing to be part of this. Like you, right. Um, but not just losing, but losing it. 
Right. Right. Because, you, you know, like, and, and Zidane's thing is like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You know, I represent everyone. And I, you know, he was very, he's so abashed, even, you know, today about that moment. Um, and this is, but Rankine's like, dude, that was awesome. Right. What, you know, what else would you do if someone did that and got in your face about how you didn't come through and blah, 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 blah. Of course you would have that reaction. Um, so, yeah. So I have a kind of follow up question. Because it's precisely on this question of temporality that, mm -hmm. that uh, the talk was really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in a switch to the comic narrative, I was thinking of um, one of the differences that uh, is often imputed to a uh, graphic novel versus um, things like film right. is precisely its ability to slow things down right. in this, in the, and create a moment, you know, have a volume be dedicated to one moment. Right, right. Um, and that kind of willful uh, play with temporality is somehow parallel to the, the slow motion mm -hmm. doing a, a, in these situational videos mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from what you've, you've shown us. Sure. Um, which then seems to me to be very problematic to what is, uh, you're quoting uh, Ron Keen as, as claiming, which is, right. is it was, if, I, if I get this right, as if I was there in real time. Right. Which is precisely the opposite, right? In real time, it's, it's gone. Right. And, and then there was this moment in your talk where you yourself kind of do it, where you say, imagine that, you know, in that moment. In, in that exactly, split second, in right. Split second, in the split second when Zidane has headed it and he knows it's going in. Yeah, but, but to me, that, that moment mm -hmm. felt false in the sense that I, I, I thought, like, he's probably just happy he kicked the ball and he was going in. And to think about the whole weight of it in that flash, you know, maybe he's embedded in, in all of that, and so it's understood in his persona that this is the case, but to actually think through the sort of logical constructions of the nation weighing down on him in that particular flash of a second seemed a little bit like uh, our privileged position of, of, of YouTube and being able to watch the tape over and over again in slow motion. I have that wow. temporal distance and, and that power of, of, you know, of rewind. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't disagree more strenuous, strenuously. Um, I think Zidane is very much aware that he represents all people of color in France. Zidane is very much aware that by winning, uh, it you know it's, it's going to accrue a certain kind of capital that he is then very eager to spend. Right? That you know he he wants nothing more than to, than than to shut up. Uh, Jean Marie Le Pen, right? And so, and again, in that, you have to understand that the soccer community voted that save, the greatest save in the history of soccer. So it's not like he's like, oh, I'm happy it's, it's on frame. He's like, it's going in, and I've won, I've done it, I've, and you see the freeze. The freeze is him like, oh, like, you know, I mean, so no, I, I actually, I mean, as someone, as someone who grew up playing sports, I cannot disagree more, you know, because I mean, just, to, just to beat your rival in that moment, to know that, yo, the shot's going in, is and then for some fluke to have it not go in, it's devastating, and you feel it all in that instant. So, I, I get that, yeah, the, the logic of it all playing out in such, such a clear way, right? And, and particularly, it was the duality of the quote from uh, uh, Serena Williams, right? Where she's saying it's both me and, and the community, that, right? That to me could maybe explain the sort of flash, and then the I, I, I don't know, like. I'm just thinking about like the sports in the moment, whether or not you're you're the me or you're the the weight of everything else. It's easy for us to to read symbolism and and sort of do do this this yeah. I I, I mean I historical reading after the fact. No, I mean I, I think I think if you've been in those moments, it's actually you know on in for me it's on like a much smaller scale, right? But if you've been in those moments of like having to do something. Um, you know, like just, you know, beating the crosstown rival with the shot is such a, there's that moment of, you know, incredible endorphins that, that, that are released. And, so, and I can't, that's just like, you know, this little high school game. I can't imagine with two billion people watching and the weight on his shoulders and knowing I've done it. Right? And he, I mean, again, it's the greatest save in the history of soccer. That's what it took for him not to have won. You know, that instant of, I did it, and then to have it brushed away. It's got to be, it, I can't even imagine it. Um, so one, two, she's been, yes. Two comments. Yes. Uh, the first is, I'm wondering if the relationship of sports to embodiment yes. is really part of your argument. Mm -hmm. Because it's more than just these moments. Mm -hmm. And the way that I would link that is through, um, uh, you know, and I'm wondering 
if one of the ways to think about this is um, perhaps slightly more negative than your arguing ranking is, because to some degree it's like Alex Mohelii saying that um, in order to become human, mm -hmm. that has to die over and over again. Mm -hmm. Thinking mm -hmm. in order to become a citizen in these narratives, you have to achieve over and over and over again. You have to achieve, mm -hmm. and then um, you have to achieve over and over again. But then you also have to be. Um, always more vulnerable, which is why I agree with you, by the way, about the emotion piece. Right. Um, you always have to be more vulnerable to the stakes are that you get thrown out when right. you fail. Right. So I'm, I'm wondering about that. But then the other thing I wanted to, um, and, and I think that that goes, you, you need to be more explicit, cons at least consider being more explicit about the relationship about uh, between that and Ashil's ne necropolitics in terms of the dead body. Yeah, I cut out a lot. It's, this is like a longer yeah, thing, so I, did, I, had to, I, had to cut it, I had to cut it down, yes. Yeah, that, yeah. It's, it's in there, it's in so there. My second question, that's just comment, but my second is a question, which is that the global media is very different than the American one. And that is because if you're sitting yes. in the anti-apartheid movement in the 1970s where I was, right. I mean, even as a kid, because mm -hmm. I wasn't that old back then, even me, um, you're not reading the black as fighting the Nazi. You're reading the black through white eyes right. as a potential danger because he still thinks it's the Nazi. Meanwhile, it's the communist right. front. Right, right, right. So I, I, I. It's a, it's a, yeah. It's tricky because one of the things, one of the of the troubling things is. Um, all of the different permutations, all of the different sort of narrative MacGuffins that comics has to do to pull these people along, yeah. right? So how can the Red Skull still be sort of like young and healthy enough to even fight in, you know, 2016, right? Um, but, you know, right, it's the same thing. But sadly, with uh, Donald Trump, it makes it much less, um, much, it's much less of a, of a sort of suspend your, suspend your disbelief moment now based on, based on that, you know. Um, but Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, yes. Yeah, I have a question about the Sam Wilson. Sure. Um, it's interesting, and this is following on kind of what Jonathan was talking about, too. Right? You, you show us the fight with the Red Skull, right. kind of the classic, traditional mm -hmm. uh, kind of comedy of the battle. Right. But in the, in the title, in the Sam Wilson title, it's interesting, especially when you compare it with the other Captain America title, yep. the White Steve Rogers, right. who's a, now a sleeper agent for terrorists. That's been that's been explained away, but anyway, go. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and Wilson looks interesting to me because it often the first page to recap has come before they have Twitter feeds. Right. And it really shows Sam Wilson is kind of in the realm of public opinion. Yeah. And his status is always uh, under contention. Yep. Right? And the, the conflicts in that comic, I would argue, are not him punching Nazis in the face. Right. It's him dealing with border patrol. No, of course. With of course. Overzealous policing. Right. In the last one I read, which was like two, a month or two ago, sure. there's this private police firm. In yes, uh, Americops. And yeah. Obviously, the writer is engaging contemporary events. No, of course. And there's, there's a debate. Um, there is a near kind of confrontation between the police, police and the black community. Yep. And Sam Wilson is kind of the moderate. Right, say don't fight, don't punch the American cops in the face. Right. And he's going up against another African American hero whose name is Rage. Yeah. Right. Subtle. Who who is <laughs> who wants to um, have violence, a violent response. Sure. So it's it's interesting to me that Sam Wilson becomes this, this he's in a very difficult position. He's a hinge. In, in, in which the writer the, I can't remember the name of the writer, but sure. Spencer. Yeah, but yeah. Right, Spencer. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he's operating in a much different way than any other Captain America right. has before, and he's, he's under intense scrutiny all the time. Um, so how, how does that kind of moment where he, he has to face almost social situations in which he can't respond to? Right, right. Well, I mean, I think. That, how does that map up against the, sp the sporting moment? Right. I mean, I think I think the 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 per the real life person who is sort of caught most in that bind right now is like it's Colin Kaepernick, right? I mean, he's right in. He's he's that 
figure and you have all these people here like hurling invective at him and then you have all these people over here so people are saying okay um, you know then that means you need to go you need to come to, to, to Charlotte you need to come to Ferguson you need to do more than just write a check right I mean there's also on um, like people in Black Lives Matter movement are also being somewhat critical although supportive ultimately of his position which is which I think is the same thing in the in the AmeriCorps versus rage where rage wants he wants his inclusion, but even more than Wilson is willing to is, is is willing to give, right? And it's this it's this it's this liminal place, right? It's this liminal place where you know you can only embody the state if you can sort of occupy that space. You can't embody the state and yet still be loyal to your own community, right? You have to be sort of stuck in in the middle, and that's and that's where he is. And, and all of these adventures, I think, are very astute. And 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 by the way, this is this is in keeping with the history of comics. Comics have always been sort of responding um, very transparently to the events of the day, right? Um, post 9-11, you, I mean, it's really easy to see how a, a lot of the ethical concerns that, that, that surfaced after 9-11 were playing themselves out in a bunch of different comics. In Superman, for example, it led to Superman renouncing his American citizenship, right? And like ultimately, that's, you know, in which of course people on Fox News went crazy um, when, when this fictional character did this fictional thing. Yeah, they get we all, oh yeah they are right and so and so and, but it's and so it's interesting how much these kinds of representations matter right it's like you know the the alt right Breitbart crowd is like how dare they do this is a sign of the it's like well, it's just a, it's a fictionalized it's a fictionalized thing but somehow this representation matters so much right um, in much the same way that Colin Kaepernick kneeling like who the hell cares he did something for thirty seconds before a football game like who cares right but somehow it becomes this thing that's it's dividing America. Like really? Like it's not the killing of black men that's dividing America; it's the kneeling of this one guy. And so, I mean, I think it shows, you know, that 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 oscillating tension, that that aporia, and and the, and the way that 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 these black figures are sort of are sort of you know pushed right into that space. So. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the the role that the failure, because what I think I'm interesting is. This scene is a kind of tragedy. triumphant, right? The scenes of Jackie Robinson, Jesse Owens, right? Um, scenes of kind of triumph. But the two moments that you and Serena, or sorry, you and Claudia Rankin are both interested in are, are moments of what we might call failure, failure or right. the, at least the broader sure. sort of public world called failure. So I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship between manumission and, and something like failure. And th even if you think, well, it's not failure, there's another word for it. Right. Um, I mean, I think it's important to note, um, sort of on a, on a very literal level, um, Zidane is one of the five greatest soccer players ever, right? And so, like, this moment of failure doesn't sort of erase everything else that went before it, right? And Serena, you know, is already the greatest player of all time because she's been cheated out of two Grand Slams, right? She's currently tied with Steffi Graf. Eh, she's tied with Steffi Graf, but Steffi Graf never got cheated, like blatantly cheated. We can see the video how she got cheated out of a Grand Slam. So I think she's sort of, and, and it's important to also remember, um, you know, she ties this back to um, like fugitive slaves, right? And so let's, let's think about Douglas. And Douglas, it's a, it's, a constant attempt to achieve the ultimate freedom, right? Um, or at least as that, that's how he frames it, right? Especially in the first narrative, right? The first narrative, it's him learning to read, and then learn him learning to, to, to earn money, and then him confronting Covey. And then finally, he's like, I am free now, but I will never tell you how I had my ultimate, like, so you get to see all the failures, but you don't get to see the moment of ultimate transcendence. And he makes a point of saying that at the end, right, of, 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 of the first narrative, where he's like, you know, too many of these people, too many people, you know, basically, are, they're, they're doing tell-alls and they're removing the possibility for other people to act out and achieve their freedom in the way that I have right and so it's a very deliberate um, confrontational move in the text right and so I think that's part of what um, you know Rankine wants to celebrate right is this confrontational um, you know this 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 these confrontational moments that lead to the self gaining possession of the self right so um, and if, if you try and fail, what's well, better to try and fail than to not try at all, right? If you lose it at one moment, it's in the losing it, you're showing, you're revealing more in the losing it than you are, are in the moments of sort of calm acquiescence, right? And then it's also important to remember, right, um, that um, um, Jackie Robinson died at 50, right? Like being respectable, being this calm, 
unflappable figure literally shortened his life, right? And so it's like, hey, we're not there anymore. You know, we have more freedom than Jackie Robinson. We have more freedom than, um, 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 uh, good Lord, um, the singer. Robeson, right? We have more freedom than, than Robeson, right? So, oh, so Beyonce can, you know, do the whole thing on the, with the cop car, and she can do the whole Black Panther thing at the at the at the at the sporting event, and everyone can freak out about it. And then the week later, Beyonce's album is the number one selling album in the country. Like, yeah, you, you know. Whereas for Paul Robeson, he that would have been it, right? If Paul Robeson would have done anything as nakedly political as what Beyonce did in that moment, his career is over. Um, and so Rain Keen is 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 trying to force us to understand and like realign our understanding of what citizenship really means and what minoritized citizenship actually is and should be about. So. Uh, there's a note at the end of Citizen where the author thanks, I think it's her friends, for the examples, right? Mm -hmm. I think it refers to uh, the multiplicity of examples of the poetic guy being right. assaulted right. In, in situations that refer to you. Uh, the skin color, right? Right, right, and, right. Uh, there's also, so there are multiple layered identities. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear if it's a single player guy. We can, mm -hmm. we can, we can, we can, we goes for common. So there's a Sam Wilson also, finally in 2016, and we saw him back in the 60s, I think. Yeah. He's also a young man. So right. Uh, multiple. Two years later, and, right. and there's, we also heard that Steve Rogers is now a highly sleeper agent, so on. So there are all, all these multiple reboots and comic books sure. and comes and so on. So my question is, do you think there's also a point of comparison between maybe even poetry in general or mm. a citizen with this idea of layered uh, identity mm -hmm. as a narrator or as a poetic guy with the kind of characterization we find in comics, especially superhero right. comics, where this kind of like psyche becoming the uh, main lead right. and also narrative books. Sure, sure. Um, I think in particular, a poems like Citizen, um, also like The Wasteland and others that seek to sort of pull in multiple points of view into into like one larger narrative. I think that that they do actually resemble that kind of like cacophonic pastiche kind of um, kind of thing, right? So um, it is important. It's also important that Citizen moves from it moves from the minor to the major, right? And so we have instances where people are are you know questioning you know oh is this your is this your credit card like these little microaggression moments early and then we get to the sort of major moments and she wants us to have this sort of telescoping eye right so it's not just a multiple eye where we're getting a representative um, sample of like what it is to live in, to live in a black body it's also this telescoping eye where we're getting the minor and also the major we're getting like crescendos and also these minor notes at the same time um, and I think that you I mean you know comics work that way as well um, that you know some of the, you know, and if you're someone who reads comics, some of the best comics are the comic, is, is the comic after the big thing has happened, right? It's like, oh, we defeated Galactus, and then the next issue is just them sitting around talking, right? And it could, because it's, there's, there's almost like a narrative exhaustion where they're, they're sort of like clearing your palate for the next big thing to come. But those oftentimes are like the issues that like people really seize upon, right? Um, and so I think, yeah, I mean, I think this, this sort of oscillation um, in many different registers, right? Um, and uh, and, yeah, and, and, there's, there, and of course, there's always there's a there's a meta textual explanation for this as well, right? That hey, these are popular characters, and we're going to keep them just the way they are, so that they're they continue to be popular. We're going to update them and make them relevant, you know, in terms of what's going on today. Um, and so that's sort of the, the corporate neoliberal outside of the logic of the text reason. Um, but I think there's there's even insight to be gained there, right? Yes. I just add one sentence, and the same happens to sports people. Yeah. There, so Serena Williams might be the best tennis player in the history. Yep. But in ten years' time, yeah, you might get one for right. thirty times. Times. Right, and and it's 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 true, right? So like so now it's like oh LeBron James, LeBron is not actually competing against. Well, I mean, he is, but he's not. He's, he's competing against the, the other 30 teams, but he's also com now competing against Michael and Magic, right? Because it's like, okay, you're at that point, but if you win one or two more, you, we will have to displace these other figures, right? And it's, but, but again, Michael and Magic never change, right? They're always 28 making the game-winning shot, you know, 24 throwing the amazing pass, and it's the person in the temporal present who is, and, and LeBron knows this, right? LeBron talks all the time about, you know, sort of, I'm, I'm, 
trying to defeat my, my, you know, my contemporaries, but I'm also trying to make myself an immortal. Like he's very aware of that sort of, of that, of that similar kind of oscillation, right? And so yeah, I think that that's, I think that's, that's definitely true, so. So we're out of time, so please join me in thanking you.